Folks, welcome. Find yourselves a seat, and I'd like to introduce our, our speaker, who's uh, Matthew Hodgson from uh, the Matrix Project. I don't know if folks have been following Matrix, but they've um, had a bit of a coup in 2018, um, where they effectively persuaded the, uh, the French government to um, move a lot of the government messaging services onto Matrix, which is an open source project. Uh, which is a bit of contrast to, uh, to my own government, who seem to be running um, foreign policy on WhatsApp and Slack. So Matt's going to tell us a little bit about um, Matrix and how they, uh, how they are um, changing the way the French government um, communicate, right? Yep, absolutely. Well, thank you very much for the, for the intro. Um, first of all, apologies, everybody, that I'm almost entirely losing my voice, which is obviously precisely what you want to have um, before doing a main stage talk at FOSDEM. But can you hear me okay? Yep, okay. If I'm going too fast or too loud or too quiet or too low or whatever, or if my voice just stops working, please just yell at me. Feel free to interrupt or heckle um, if you like. And um, I'd like to talk to you... <laughs> hey. um, so yeah, basically we'd like to talk about Matrix, um, both in context of the French um, utilization over the last year that Rob was just talking about, and also we'd like to introduce Matrix 1.0 as we are on the cusp of coming out of beta after four and a half long years of um, building Matrix to where it is today. So it's basically going to be a mix of talking a bit about what we did with France and honestly how the French project forced us um, to make damn sure that Matrix would come out of beta because having bet on us as a protocol and a project, we've obviously needed to make sure that it's fit for purpose. So first of all, Matrix itself. I'm guessing a lot of people here now know what Matrix is. Anybody who don't know what Matrix is? Okay, okay, well, we've got a majority knowing, so I'll quickly go through the um, normal stuff trying to explain what we are. Take a few minutes. Sorry that it will bore everybody else. So Matrix is an open network for secure, decentralized, real-time communication. So it's a protocol in the end. It's a set of APIs, a set of HTTP APIs, to be precise, um, to let you send and receive messages but it is also the resulting openly federated global public network that results. And what can you use it for? Well, the main thing is interoperable chat. However, in the end, Matrix is just a data synchronization layer. In the end, it's pub-sub of any kind of JSON data, and that could be um, setting up VoIP calls, it could be doing communication over VR and AR, and we, we've done a couple of silly demos where you have scene graphs um, expressed over Matrix, or setting up video calls, or 3D video calls over Matrix in VR. Or it could be real-time IoT or machine-to-machine messaging of any kind. So the mission here is really to re provide an open replacement to the public telephony network, or indeed a replacement to email, to create a global decentralized encrypted comms network that is providing an open platform where any of us can hack on top of it and provide open real-time communication. There are some fundamental differences with other ways of doing this in the in matrix, um, the first class citizen is not um, the messages you pass back and forth, it is the conversation history of the rooms which you're talking in. And this is the thing that a lot of people don't get and it's critical to understand that matrix is if anything quite similar to Git You've got a big distributed data structure that is being replicated across the various different people participating in it. In Git, uh, we're going and replicating commits. In Matrix, we replicate conversation history. So this is fundamentally different to, say, XMPP or SIP or IRC or any other open communication protocol where you're typically just taking a message and passing it to somebody else via a server. In Matrix, you're going and synchronizing your server's copy of a conversation with all of the other servers participating in that room. So this is a really important thing, that no single server controls that conversation, unless, of course, there's only one server participating in the conversation. So if I'm on matrix.org and I'm talking to somebody on a gov.fr French Matrix server, then if matrix.org goes down, they keep a copy of that conversation, and it will persist and prevail for as long as their server is online. And then when I come back online, my copy will be um, resolved, merged with their copy, 
and uh, will continue talking to one another. So in practice, one way of thinking of this is also as a thing to fill this void here, that you have all of these centralized communication services or all of these communication silos. And it could be a proprietary closed thing like Slack or Discord or Telegram. It could be an open system like IRC, albeit closed federation. It could be an open system like XMPP, but with open federation. Or it could be uh, another closed system like Gitter. A matrix exists as this decentralized network connecting them all. And you can use it natively with a matrix client um, talking through to one of these matrix servers. Or you can have a bridge that connects through to Slack or to IRC. And as of a month ago, XMPP, we now have first class XMPP bridging and matrix, which I'll talk about and hopefully show off um, a bit later. And you, know, you don't have to use matrix, but it's there either to use natively or to glue together these different silos and provide an open pub-sub framework for the internet. I've already explained that the two big differentiators is that no single party owns your conversations and that they are replicated over all of the participants. Architecturally, you have clients which talk a very thin HTTP protocol to your server. You have the servers which talk a much um, more interesting HTTP protocol to one another. You have application servers which are basically clients on steroids. They do all the interesting stuff. And then finally, you have identity servers, which are still a little bit of a gray area of matrix, which handle the problem of how do you discover who you want to talk to. And um, whilst I say that all of these APIs currently are HTTP, matrix itself is agnostic to the transport that you use. We specify it as HTTP and JSON today, but you could equally well um, use more exotic transports. And in fact, we have finally built one uh, which is built on CoAP and Seabor using noise for end-to-end -end encryption. And we're going to be talking about that actually in the real-time comms um, dev room tomorrow if anybody uh, is interested in super low bandwidth um, transports. So what do you get in Matrix? Well, obviously, you get decentralized conversation history as the first-class building block. You get group messaging and one-to-one -one messaging only as a subset of group messaging. End-to-end -end encryption is a massive, massive um, focus for us because we replicate your data over all of the participating servers. If that isn't end-to-end -end encrypted, it's a train wreck, if it's private data at least, because you're just increasing the attack envelope of that data every time you talk to somebody on a new server. They get a copy of it. So you really want to make sure that the server admins can't be snooping on your messages and that they are protected end-to-end. -end. Uh, you get VoIP signaling, you get push notification rules, server-side search, read receipts, typing notifications, presence, read state and unread counts. Turns out that unread counts are a pain in the ass, but we have them. Um, decentralized content repository and even account data per room. So it's a real kitchen sink of a spec. And again, this is a bit of an unusual thing in that whilst it is layered internally, the spec itself is effectively one big document. And if I say, hey, I've got a server and a client here that speaks Matrix 1.0. Assuming that it's you know, a phone or a web browser or whatever, then it should implement all of these. So you don't get any fragmentation uh, where you have some client which you know, decided not to do VoIP or something. In theory, at least, you should be able to use the same spec for everything. And you don't need to mix and match different extensions. You don't need to mix and match different modules. There is only one true canonical way of building your matrix at any given point. So the ecosystem, as it stands today, has moved on a bit um, from years gone by. Um, the green stuff is stuff that we provide as the matrix.org project. And we provide a web stack um, on React, a legacy Angular one. And we also have the Riot flagship app, which uh, we build on top of it. And uh, we have an equivalent iOS stack, currently written in Objective-C. And on Android these days, we have two stacks. We have a Java stack called Matrix Android SDK, and we also have um, the Android, um, sorry, Matrix SDK Android, which is written in Kotlin. Now, this is an entire rewrite of the Android stack that has been going on for the last couple of months. Um, it uses Rx as a um, layer on top um, to handle the data flow as in a reactive model. And there is a whole new rewrite of Riot on Android on top of it called Riot X at the moment. It's a code name. 
but it gives you an idea that it's a total rewrite from the ground up, which I'll hopefully have time to give a quick demo of later. And um, so that's all new. On the server side, we have our Python server and our Go server and a whole fleet of different bridges and application services and bots and things. Now, we started the Go server a few years ago in order to replace um, the Python code base, but we've hit the classic problem that the Python code base is actually quite um, featureful and also starting to roll out to lots of big places like France, for instance, and also, we wanted to get out of beta at last and release a 1.0 of the spec. So we had a choice of do we go and implement the 1.0 spec on both the Python thing to support everybody already on Python as well as the Go code base at the same time and have to basically halve our um, throughput and uh, momentum because we've got to do both at the same time and we have to iterate on both at the same time. Or are we going to get it right on Python ship the 1.0, and then bring the Go up to speed. And that's what we've chosen to do in the end. So Dendrite has been plugging along, and we've got people contributing to it, and so we spend some time working on it ourselves. But I'm afraid it's running a bit late, um, like all the best second systems do. Um, but when it lands, it should be a bit like Firefox merging Servo and uh, all the good Rust stuff, and it will be unrecognizably better from where the Python is today. But right now, we're shipping 1.0 on Synapse. Meanwhile, on the community side of things, lots and lots of projects out there. Um, the C Glass is a new one, a native Mac OS um, client, which is really, really nice. It actually builds on top of the iOS SDK, um, which turns out to also run perfectly on Mac OS. Um, but it provides end-to-end -end encryption and all sorts of nice stuff as a result. Command line clients like GoMax, um, you've got the GNOME project providing Fractal in Rust, a Caternion in Qt and um, C++. Also, there was a really nice cute um, um, project called Neko, which um, got archived a few months ago when the maintainer um, quit, but has just been reborn in the last um, couple of weeks um, by a new maintainer. It's now called Neko Reborn, and um, they're setting up um, for a new release um, pretty soon. So if you're a sad Neko user who was unhappy that it went on hiatus, as far as I can tell, it's back. So, brief history, actually, of where we got to, um, or how we got to today. We started this back in May 2014, wrote a bunch of code, honestly, way too quickly, in a mad rush of, wow, we're actually getting to build a crazy open communications network, and everybody threw lots of Python at the wall to see what would stick. Um, we shipped it in September as the first alpha, and it was very alpha. Um, in 2015, around March, Federation became usable. We added Postgres as well as SQLite, added IRC bridging specifically for Freenode. Uh, and then later in the year, we released Vector, as it was called, uh, as our flagship matrix client. Um, and we also actually cut our first release of the client server API. So if you ever wondered why there are so many matrix clients out there and why it's so easy to write a matrix client, it's kind of because we actually um, locked down our first stable release all the way back then in 2015, but only of the client server API. And for context, in Matrix, you get five APIs. You get the client server, you get the server server, which is the federation one. You get the identity server, which is the one about discovering who to talk to. You get application services, which allow you to build your bridges and your bots and things. And you get push. Um, which is specifically for hooking into APNS or GCM or whatever other push um, layer you have. So back in 2015, we had only one of these um, stabilized. Then 2016 was an awful lot of watching Synapse fall over. Honestly, uh, we had some real scaling problems thanks to the slightly rushed way in which the project had come together. Um, we also started a lot of work on end-to-end -end encryption, literally man years, to try to add that in. And it turns out that end-to-end -end in a decentralized model is hard. You have problems like, um, who is in the room? Because if you have an eventually consistent big decentralized room and some guy's server goes offline for a few hours and he adds on a couple of devices on his local server and he comes back, should he have been in the conversation? Who knows? It's a bit of a philosophical question. If a tree falls in a wood and no one's there, blah, 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 all that sort of thing. So it's, um, we spent a lot of time on end-to-end. -end. We rebranded Vector as Riot.
workspace. Uh, we had a contribution of internationalization. All internationalization in Riot was um, contributed um, by a chap called MTR Nord in the community, very kindly. Um, and we also started Dendrite. However, we also had a couple of big problems in 2017, one of which that we were piling on new features and we were still in beta. And it's, I think, fair to say that we weren't getting the level of polish and the level of um, stability that we should have on our existing stuff before chucking more things at the wall. And one of the reasons we were piling on features was also that we were running into funding problems because for the first three years of Matrix, we were sponsored to do this by our day job, which is working at a big multinational um, telco supplier called Amdox. And after three years, they decided to stop funding us um, mainly because they saw that Matrix was starting to be successful, and they thought, hey, this is looking so great, you guys can look after yourselves. I'm sure lots of people will come to you and want to get Matrix deployments, and hey, good luck. So we parted ways with them in 2017. In order to try to raise money, we spent a lot of time building out stickers and other slightly um, well, sort of featureful things like that, but it certainly didn't help our stability. Then, in 2018, uh, we were lucky enough to solve the funding problems um, thanks to an investment from another decentralized communications project um, called Status.im. Is there anybody from Status here? It's got to be someone. Oh, I saw them earlier, perhaps they're fleeing from the talk. But basically, Status uh, um, uh, gave us enough funding to be able to hire the core team of Matrix and set up a, a startup to go and keep hacking on Matrix as well as providing services around Matrix. And the good news is that we could feature freeze. So we basically didn't ship anything new in the way of features um, last year. Everything was about the road to getting the hell out of beta, getting to 1.0, fixing security issues, um, some really long-standing security issues which were design flaws in the Federation API, also fixing our stability uh, in Synapse, not necessarily our scalability, but also um, uh, basically trying to make sure that you can run Synapse in production with a straight face and you're not going to get owned. And then finally, um, at governance, because having gone and set up a for-profit business to hire the core team, we want to make damn sure that Matrix itself is independent of that so that other people, whether they're non-profit or for-profit, can go and build on top of Matrix without any concerns of the direction of the standard. So basically, set up a foundation who control and act as a neutral guardian for the project. And we consider that a blocker for Matrix 1.0. And then this year, as of basically this week, shipping 1.0 at last, and then beyond. So sorry for the boring history, but I thought it might be interesting to give a bit of context to where we are now. Um, in terms of uptake in general on Matrix, this is um, daily active users on the matrix.org server over the last three years. And as you can see, in 2016, there was pretty much nothing. Then in 2017, we really started to see um, some uh, stuff taking off. 2018, we ended up in this interesting situation of a plateau over the course of the summer. And this was because we were putting all of our effort into security and stability. We had um, folks trying to exploit um, the issues which we had in the server-to-server -server API from the um, outset and um, given a choice between keeping the scalability and the scaling on Synapse up with the traffic growth, we chose to drop everything and go and address the security stuff so we could get out of um, beta. And we did that, um, and you can literally see the point where we shipped the first wave of security stuff and could work on performance again, at which point the glass ceiling is removed and well, off we go again um, at the rate that we were before. Another way of thinking of this is the number of um, servers we can see from matrix.org. Uh, it was pretty much, it was pretty small um, until um, the beginning of 2016. And then it grew a lot over 2017. Again, over the summer of last year, it had a bit of a wobble, but we're now on track again with about 12,000 servers who are phoning home one way or another. Now, it's worth noting that um, a lot of people don't phone home. A lot of people don't even publicly federate. So, for instance, the French deployment, which I promise I will talk about in a second, um, have, um, you know, they don't phone home, and they've got well, potentially millions of users on it. So the important thing is the shape of the graphs here rather than the y-axis. 
In practice, right now, we see about 7 million global visible accounts, um, of which uh, about 3.5 million are on the matrix.org home server. So this is deliberate, for better or worse. The matrix.org is a default server that people get set up on, and about 50% of the population are sitting on it. We hope, in the long term, to turn it off. It's very much a bootstrapping exercise, giving an easy option for people to use. And as we get more publicly available, stable servers out there, and once critically we have account migration so that people can move on to them, then we are just going to kill it. We can see a couple of million messages a day. Um, oh, or my last version of the slide from a few months ago was one and a half million messages a day. Um, and about 20 messages a second coming in, 2,000 going out. Hundreds of projects building on it, and a whole bunch of companies too. So, what about France? What happened with France is that the Ministry of Digital, who are called DINSIC, I'm not going to try to say that in French, actually reached out to us. So this wasn't a matter of us persuading them. As it happens, um, they pinged one of the guys who was working on the Android Riot client and um, say, hey, uh, what can we do um, to get a copy of Riot for our own purposes? And it turned out that what they were actually looking for was self-sovereign, i.e. run by France rather than run by Silicon Valley in the case of WhatsApp or run by Russia in the case of Telegram. Um, self-sovereign, end-to-end encrypted, decentralized communication. Now, a lot of people say, why the hell does a government need decentralized communication? Surely governments are inherently centralized. Except they're really not. As in a government is made up of ministries, it's made up of offices, it's made up of departments and sub-departments and sub-ministries, and you've got hospitals, you've got teachers, you've got schools, universities. The public sector is massive. Turns out that in France it's 5.5 million users um, are in the public sector. Over 10% of the population of the country is served or will be served by this deployment. So what they wanted and what they've got is to have operationally independent deployments of matrix per ministry. So, I don't know, the Ministry of Digital is going to have completely different requirements to the Ministry of the Army, and they are going to have different operational security, different infosec requirements. Um, perhaps they want to run it on-premise, perhaps they want to use a cloud provider, perhaps they've got six antivirus systems that everything has to be run through, perhaps um, you know, they want to block a particular class of attachment, perhaps they only want data to flow one direction, they only want um, people to be able to invite conversations into the Prime Minister's office, or sorry, they only want the Prime Minister to be able to invite outwards. They don't want him to get spammed by everybody else constantly going and connecting to him via matrix. So the way it's set up is uh, each ministry has its own deployment. Um, they're all running um, uh, a dedicated full stack of matrix so that you can have ministries go offline or they can disconnect themselves from the internet or from one another. Um, and also, uh, they had a bunch of other requirements. They needed enterprise-grade antivirus support as well as end-to-end -end encryption. Now, this is obviously a contradiction in terms, because you can't have decent end-to-end -end encryption, which um, is not letting anybody man in the middle of your traffic, as well as having a rapidly adaptive antivirus system where you've got some service somewhere which you have to run all the attachments through. I guess you could try to run it client-side, but then you end up downloading the nasty thing and scanning it client-side and doing that on mobile in a de decent manner in such a way that means that your client-side antivirus scanner doesn't get owned and all that sort of thing. It, it, it becomes a mess. So we had to do a lot of work um, to support that, which is going to land in Matrix itself. Talk about it in a minute. And um, also different security zones, um, as I mentioned earlier. And really excitingly, and surprisingly to us at first, whilst they're starting off with a private federation, they're also interested in going public. So they want to be able to connect with other governments, they want to connect with other companies, but, and it's a very pragmatic reason why, that it's all very well having this really sexy um, self-run communication system inside the government, but uh, the second that you want to talk to a supplier or a contractor or somebody else, if they're not on the same system, you're just going to be back on WhatsApp or Slack or whatever. So it's critical for them to be able to connect through to the wider world. So current status is that we, um, uh, the development started on the app. And the apps, by the way, are written um, by them with, with some level of support from us. Um, it started in May, and it's a fork of Riot. Um, it sits on GitHub there. 
Um, they're not promoting that URL at all. So if you go there, you'll see it's basically just a bunch of repositories with no details at all. I imagine that when it um, goes completely live, they'll be making a lot more of a noise about it. But I, I'm here representing Matrix rather than them talking about it from the Matrix perspective. Started off on Android, then web, then iOS. Then started rolling it out in June. Then had to do a bunch of audits from ANSI, which is the French version of the NSA, um, to check that this thing is going to be stable and usable from an operational perspective. More recently, there's an IT audit also going on from EY. And now, as of January, it's being rolled out across all the ministries, um, and that's a lot of Ansible. So demo-wise, let me see if I can quickly pull it up. I was going to demo it on Android because that's um, the most um, mature um, one. Um, however, it turns out that they've locked down the permissions on Android such that you cannot screen share it at all. It really aggressively fights you. So given a choice between doing a custom build where we disable the screen share and screen cap restrictions and using iOS, I'm afraid I'm going to just go and use iOS. So let me just try screen sharing and see if this works. Come on. Probably help if I had internet access. Should I get on a network and then perhaps this might work? One second. Come on. Yep, there we go. Right now, hopefully, I might be able to. Screen share. Hello. All right, brilliant. So um, here is the app. Um, it's called some Chap, um, or BChap for the beta version of it. And as you can see, um, it looks a bit like a Matrix client. And honestly, there's not that much um, to show you here. Weirdly enough, I'm on the pre-production system rather than the actual live um, platform, as fun as it would be to start looking at all of the ministry um, chat rooms and all of the conversations there. So this is just um, uh, uh, the dev team um, hanging out together. Um, you can see um, it is end-to-end -end encrypted by default. We've got all of the little um, um, Ohm encryption um, padlocks there. And you can see me testing and say, hello, like so, or gecko, because I can't spell at all. Um, an interesting thing, um, if I send a photo into this here, I'm going to send it tiny, that it does this antivirus dance. So it's going and uploading, um, in fact, it's not even uploading. What it's doing is taking the key data for that file not the matrix message, not the matrix room, but specifically the key data for that file and exfiltrating it deliberately to an, uh, an, uh, to an antivirus server. Now, that antivirus server is on a totally different deployment. There is no operational overlap at all um, between the main matrix home server and the thing you're using to communicate, and then there's completely separate run by information security folks, which does one thing and one thing only, you give it a URL and an encrypted set of keys, it decrypts the keys, it checks the URL, scans it, and then proxies the result through. And we do it both when you upload and when you download. And so we wrote that actually as a node-based um, content scanner called Matrix Content Scanner, which is available today. And we're going to add that to the Matrix spec as a really important thing to basically have inherent first-class um, antivirus. And I think that's about all I can show you um, of the app itself. What's that? It does do GIFs, yeah. Um, uh, it also does emoji and stickers and things too. I mean, as a fork of right, it gets the whole kitchen sink of stuff. They've actually reduced some of the functionality to make it more usable. And ironically, it's probably more usable than Riot is today because they've had a professional UX agency working away designing quite a good-looking app. But um, that is where that sits today. So a very approximate schematic that does not remotely resemble the real thing for obvious reasons is that you end up with a private federation of a whole bunch of ministries um, talking to one another. Some of these are public-facing um, servers so that people in future will be able to install the app from the App Store and jump onto a France-hosted public matrix server. However, in future, we'd also expect there to be a border gateway federating it through to the public matrix network so it can talk to other governments, etc. Also, as always, there's scope for doing integrations. There are actually aren't any running yet, but we're hoping they'll do a bunch. And obviously bridges to other protocols too. We're not running any bridges there yet, but again, I can imagine that, no, I, th I believe that NATO uses XMPP, and so I can imagine that some of the military guys there are going to want to be talking through to XMPP and have a bridge to do so. 
So in terms of the stuff that's been driven by France, going quickly, end-to-end, -end, I kind of already explained how it works. You have to exfiltrate the keys, but we do this as well as possible. We send the URL and the encrypted encryption keys using a pinned public key for the service. It's an isolated service. Um, you talk HTTPS to it. It, in turn, talks ICAP, which is the slightly GPS standard for antivirus scanning. And we're going to add it to the spec, and you can play with it today um, for a matrix content scanner. Lots and lots of Ansible stuff. Unfortunately, this stuff isn't FOSS, but it is forked off our FOSS Ansible playbooks. There are 27 of them, there are 27 roles. You get Synapse, you get your identity server, obviously Postgres, the antivirus, a RAID shake server for gathering bug reports, turn servers, like the whole enchilada. 730 things uh, in total. Performance, they drove a lot of performance work. So one of the big things we landed last year was la lazy loading members. Previously, when you join a matrix room or when you log into your account, it loads the profile data of every user everywhere that you can see. And on my account, that's about 120 megabytes of JSON. I hear this is not great. So we implemented lazy loading, which only syncs the membership data about the people who are actively talking in your um, room. And that is... Um, Typically, a factor of five or so improvement. So once G zips for me, it's down to about two megabytes of zip JSON when I log into my account. But my account is massive. It's like 2,000 conversations. Um, also, we ported everything to Python 3. Um, this was originally a community project done by a chap called um, Not a File with support from Intel FX. Um, and then we took over and did it from the core team um, by hiring um, a lady called Hawkow, Amber Brown, who is also the release manager for Twisted. And there is no better person in the world than the person who ported Twisted from Python 2 to Python 3 to also port Synapse from Python 2 to Python 3. And we shipped this, um, uh, I guess, in November, I think, in Synapse 34, and it turned out to be a massive improvement. Python 3 stores strings as UTF-8 rather than 32-bit UCS-32. So you immediately get two to three times improvement on RAM. And also, it turns out that some of our workloads on CPU were magically sped up. I haven't really bothered finding out why, to be honest, but some of the Synapse worker processes started using two times, three times less CPU. And just anecdotally, if you haven't shifted your home server to Python 3, do it now because it just feels nice and snappy. Finally, lots and lots of ongoing work on Synapse to profile for bottlenecks and make the caching work better. Now, this is more about performance than the resource utilization, and I'm sorry to say that Synapse is still a bit of a dog in terms of memory usage and disk usage. Once we've shipped 1.0, which is basically now, the, one of the first things on our to-do list is to fix that at last. So, finally, just one last massive thing, driven by France, 1.0. There's no way that a government is going to go live with something with a big beta logo on it, and we are not going to cheat and just remove beta and claim, oh yeah, it's perfect now. We actually had to ship um, a proper 1.0. So in practice, that means cutting stable spec releases of all of the matrix APIs, and we want to make it correct and then make it first. We had to fix the design thinkers, which had been plaguing the Federation API, we need to have the infrastructure to roll those changes out, which turns out to be a massive deal. We really screwed up by not baking the idea of room versions into Matrix from the outset. So um, I, if you ever build a protocol, make damn sure you can ratchet the version of everything um, from the outset. Otherwise, you just paint yourself into a corner. One day, you discover a bug in your Federation API, and then before you can fix it, you have to retrofit a whole versioning system on. We wanted to get the governance in place and also want to get as much stuff to turn on end-to-end -end encryption by default and then exit beta. So, Federation. We were slow on getting a stable spec. I already said that in 2015, we cut our first client server API. Then we shipped the other three in August of last year, but still couldn't ship a stable Federation API because it had some pretty big design flaws, one of which is that we chose perspectives for certificate management. We thought back in 2014 that we would be cool and hip and we wouldn't use those evil certificate authorities to tell us who to trust. Instead, we would go and democratize this to the matrix population. 
and we would have notary servers which by consensus would decide whether a given TLS certificate belongs to the correct server. So if you've got a room with 20 servers in it, if 10 of them agree that the correct fingerprint for that server is that fingerprint, then that should be good enough. We don't need any damn CAs. And it was a disaster. Firstly, because we didn't finish it, because it turns out to get all the consensus stuff working is a pain in the ass, and we prioritized matrix stuff rather than building TLS infrastructure. Secondly, Let's Encrypt came along, and it didn't exist when we started it, but a couple of years later it did. At which point, Perspectives as an initiative that was already on life support just died, because why would you mess around with this when you can just use Let's Encrypt? And we basically ended up with this embarrassment that lots of people had set up self-signed certificates for their home servers. However, the trust was just not really there. So what we've done and in 1.0, I'm afraid, is to kill self-signed certificates. So if you're running a matrix server with a self-signed certificate, please upgrade to Synapse 0.99 and delete it, the certificate, not the server. And you can do that now because we added me support into Synapse, so it will transparently talk to Let's Encrypt and give you a real proper certificate for that server. Another thing is that our fundamental merge resolution algorithm, so-called state resolution um, for um, matrix, uh, was broken. We had some bugs um, which would create unexpected results when you particularly have an old copy of a room from a server that's been offline for a while, and it comes back, and you have to resolve state of the room, like who is in the room. And sometimes it would pick the old copy over the new one, which is embarrassing because it means that time will go backwards and you get what we call a state reset, where people who were in the room suddenly find themselves teleported back into it. It's also called the Hotel California bug, and it's really embarrassing and annoying, and it turned out to be really, really hard to fix because we needed to throw away the whole merge resolution algorithm and replace it with one that worked. And in order to do that, we then needed to provide the versioning stuff. And finally, we also had screw-ups like um, letting servers create event IDs, like email or um, SIP. And, you know, what's wrong with that? Um, why not let people create their own IDs? Well, the problem is that in a decentralized system, you can have two servers maliciously um, claim that the same ID points to different content, and you have a disaster going on. So we've had to change our entire ID structure for Matrix 1.0 so the IDs are now the hash of the contents. So you cannot lie about the contents of an event, and instead everything is content addressable, at least for event IDs. And again, that needs you to be able to ratchet the protocol to do that. These are now all fixed. As of about 2 o'clock this morning, we cut release 0.1 of the server-to-server -server API, so for the first time ever, there is a final, finished, stable federation API for Matrix, and if you are feeling particularly ambitious, go take it and try to implement a home server. And that is the first time... Thank you. I should also add that I had relatively little to do with this. This is all the work of the Paul Synapse and the Spec team who have been desperately blitzing through this nightmare to get it out the door. And, um, yeah, I mean, uh, we're actually at that point um, at last. Um, uh, now, I should add, this isn't Matrix 1.0. We do now have all five APIs at a stable release. We do need to release an update to the CS API and the Identity Server API, which will be coming over the next week. We need to push for a couple of spec um, updates for that and then cut it. But then we exit beta fully. So, already talked about no more self-signed certificates. Delete your self-signed certificates. Synapse 0.99 will talk to, um, uh, doesn't require the new certificates, but it does do at me. Um, Synapse 0.99, which we released, uh, um, well, is basically being released right now. We've got the final release candidate yesterday. Um, is almost the same as what we will ship in Synapse 1.0, except 1.0 will refuse to connect to self-signed servers. So you've got a month, basically, to get rid of those self-signed certificates. Also, side effect of um, moving to real TLS certificates is that you have problems. If you are bigcorp.com and you want to delegate your matrix server to bigcorpmatrixhosting.com because it's quite possible that as bigcorp.com, like if you're Google, you're not going to give some random matrix hosting company a top-level SSL certificate for google.com. 
So instead, we have shifted to using well-known URIs in order to let bigcorp.com delegate to a given server. And it allows the webmaster for google.com or whoever to say, hey, well-known uh, matrix server, please delegate all of this over to google.matrixhosting.com. And then you do the normal SRV and TLS lookup on that domain. We could have also done this all using SRV, but it ends up being more vulnerable to DNS poisoning than building on top of the well-known URI system. So again, an action for anybody who is running a server where they use SRV to delegate to somewhere else, you need to add a well-known URI if you don't control the host name that you're running the server for. And again, that's supported today in Synapse 99. State resolution. I don't have time to talk about it, but we put a ton of work into what we call V2 state res, or state res reloaded, a bit like matrix reloaded. Um, and um, I won't go into it in detail, but suffice it to say that we've hopefully addressed all of the vulnerabilities and attacks which were leveled against the original one. So you could, in theory, upgrade to the new resolution algorithm today. However, version two rooms rapidly got replaced by version three rooms, which replace our old IDs with our base64 hash IDs. Um, so in the near future, um, once no Synapse 0.99 is released um, out of release candidate, probably on Monday, we will encourage everybody to upgrade their rooms. Now this is big. Like any room, any public room particularly, we're going to need the admin of the room to hit the big upgrade button that will appear in at least Riot, and uh, hopefully, I think Quaternion has also implemented UI for this. So what it will look like as a room admin is that you get a warning at the top of the room saying, this room is vulnerable, it's running an old version of Matrix, press here to upgrade it. This will then magically create a new room, invite the old people into it, and um, stitch the two together so that you have some level of continuity. But in practice, it is the ratcheting that I keep going on about to let people migrate to the new version. And once everybody has upgraded to version three rooms, we will be killing off the sucky old original V1 rooms, which uh, have those vulnerabilities. So, I mean, this is massive in terms of ratcheting us out of our um, sordid past. Finally, on the matrix.1 stuff, foundation. We've incorporated the matrix.org foundation as a non-profit, not-for-profit UK community interest company. We've finalized the governance, and if you're a governance geek, Go and Google for MSC 1779, which is a massive Hamilton-style declaration of matrix um, manifesto and how we pledge to make sure we don't screw up the project and so the protocol remains neutral no matter who builds on it. The key thing is that they end up with an eight-person spec team who actually manage the spec. We also have a five-person um, guardian team who are basically the board of directors for the nonprofit. We have three of these folk already, myself, Amon Dean, who came up with Matrix in the first place, and a third guy who will announce very soon. We're looking to find two more folk who can um, participate in the board of directors who we're talking to at the moment. So our lawyers are currently turning that into the actual legal articles of association, and then the Matrix.org Foundation is finished, or at least begun. Timeline. Um, we released um, our 0.1 uh, of SS yesterday, or this morning. Um, however, uh, basically, we will be uh, launching 1.0 of Synapse um, a month later in March, and Matrix Start 1 will land once we've released CS 0.5 and IS 0.2. So, I've got 10 minutes. Let's do some fun stuff. Two minutes? My God. Really? I've, I've got 50. Uh, you want to see the Riot demo rather than ask boring questions, right? Yeah. Okay, let's see a Riot demo instead. Um, so we have totally redesigned Riot to try to make it look better than Matrix or Slack. Uh, oh, sorry, better than Matrix? What am I talking about? Better than Slack or Discord. And this is what Riot looks like these days. Here is Matrix HQ. Um, I can say hi, everyone. And um, I am in thousands of different rooms here. Now, the UI is entirely resizable. Um, we can go into rooms like Synapse Dev. We can go and pull up um, files here. Um, predictably, it's full of uh, uh, GIFs of various different flavors. I think that was us um, shipping the 0.1 release of the server to server um, API. And. Um, uh, I mean, right, uh, I mean, I'm obviously biased, but I think this thing is starting to look lovely. We've got rid of all the green, 
um, it's a lot more um, flexible, and um, in terms of usability, um, it's looking a lot, lot better. Um, let me skip forward quickly to, not there, um, oh, and you can play with it right now, riot.am slash develop, um, we merged it to develop about a week ago. Um, it's still kind of pre-release candidate, but we'll be cutting a release candidate over the next week or so, and then pushing it out properly. End-to-end -end encryption. So I've got sort of zero minutes to talk about the massive amount of work that went into end-to-end -end encryption. Let's go back in time. In fact, we've even gone widescreen. That's how far back we've gone to 2017, which was the last time I was standing here in Janssen announcing end-to-end -end encryption. And the final slide was what's next. We needed to support encryption for people who aren't yet in a room. We need cross-signing um, for device ID keys, so you don't have to keep verifying. We need better device verification than comparing ugly fingerprints. We need push notifications that actually work for end-to-end. -end. We need better primitives and all the rest of it. So fast forward to today, and all of the emoji, which are the most important thing on this slide, have vanished. Um, so imagine that there is a green tech uh, um, next to everything above this point. So we now share ratchet data when you invite people into rooms. We do cross-signing, which is a massive amount of work that we squeeze together, and I'll try to demo it very quickly. Um, we've got much better device verification using short authentication strings rather than comparing fingerprints and QR codes, although QR codes hasn't landed in implementation yet. We've got key recovery backups, which is another huge amount of work. If you have one matrix client on your phone and you lose it, at the moment, unless you manually back up your keys, you are screwed. Whereas with this, it encrypts your keys and optionally stores them on the server so you can recover them in a disaster. Um, push notifications now pretty much work. Um, totally new system where your phone is actually syncing to matrix in the background to do that. And we shifted to uh, WASM. We, re, uh, we shifted all of OM over web from inscription.js and uh, ASM.js over to WASM, which sped things up by a factor of about five. So quickly, um, let me try to demo the end-to-end -end stuff. And this is going to be an interesting demo. I'll go as quick as I can. This is the new login page um, for Riot, everybody. And if I quickly go and create an um, account here, um, on my local home server, I'll call it test. And I go and create an end-to-end -end encrypted room, um, call it testing, and I go and turn on encryption. I hope you're all loving the new right UX um, here. Uh, turn on encryption like so, um, and say some messages. And we've got this big yellow thing here that says, hey, secure message recovery, which is actually what we are calling the online key backup. If I set this up right now, I can enter a recovery passphrase um, uh, like so. And I can save it um, as a recovery key um, if I want. And I authenticate. And it is now going and uploading my keys encrypted to my server. Now, obviously, some people won't want this, and you can still use it without it. But for the common case, um, it's really quite useful. Because what it lets you do is log in again on a different device. So uh, log in as 127 uh, rather than localhost. Um, log in as my test user here. And OK, here I am. Uh, on my other account, it says I've logged in on a new device. So here is the new verification flows that I can now say verify by comparing a short text string. I hit begin verify. And meanwhile, I get an incoming verification request here. Now, all I have to do is to compare um, this um, simple string between the two. It's not a big fingerprint, and we'll probably replace it with words. But imagine this was like pink, elastic, zebra, plaster, horse. And the other guy says, yeah, I've got pink, elastic, zebra, um, plaster, horse, and clicks continue. And now they have mutually verified one another like so. And if the gods are smiling at me, please, then in theory that should have automatically decrypted the message there, but the demo gods are not um, smiling on me. But suffice it to say that um, this has at least verified the two accounts here. They've both got shields. And now if I log in um, a third time, and we're almost there by the way, now, the other two in the background have got a key share request saying, hey, I've added a new device. 
But what if I can't physically get to my other devices? What if I'm on a whole new device, somebody stole my laptop and my phone, but I still want to get at my history? Well, luckily, I set up my, um, verif my key um, backup system. So I can go into here and hit the restore backup. I can type um, my top secret um, uh, passphrase. And if I now go into the encrypted conversation here, I have my full history, and even better, I have cross-signing working, verifying the other devices, both of them. So I only ever had to verify once there, and then verify in turn by the fact that I knew what my passphrase was, and I have access to my entire set of devices. So if you compare that with Matrix Today, where you spend your life comparing fingerprints to different devices all over the place, you should have to do it just once. Thank you. Um, yeah, you just hit once, and it should um, sit there forever, and you can rehydrate it out of your backup as de 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 um, intended. Now, we weren't hoping to show that today, but at the beginning of the week, I said to Dave Baker and Hubert Chaffee, who have been working on it, guys, wouldn't it be cool if we actually showed cross-signing at Fosdem? And they looked at me with a slightly stressed expression and said, yeah, okay, perhaps we'll see whether we can pull it together. And as of 4 a.m. this morning, the demo finally came together. So admittedly, that is the only flow that even vaguely works, but it will be landing properly um, any minute now. And I think I'm probably well and truly out of time. Um, really? Just like 10 seconds? Nope, no. Oh. I'm not going to get fired. That's oh, such a shame because I did so much want to just show Riot X. Just, just one second. <laughs> because, oh, seriously, guys, Riot X here looks amazing. It's set up to look like the, um, uh, like the new app. It launches 10 times faster. It doesn't suck. Anyway, thank you, everybody. I don't think we're going to have any time for questions, unfortunately. But where, where are you going to be after this? Yeah, we're at the Real Time Lounge you. next to the X and PP and the Olang guys up on the first floor of K Building. And we'll be there all afternoon, so come talk to us afterwards. Thank you for coming. <laughs>